When it came to the 2018 NFL Draft, the Los Angeles Rams were going to be one of the least consequential teams during the three-day draft weekend. No first-round pick. You've traded that away in order to get Brandon Cooks, who's in a contract year. No second-round pick, and I believe that still ties into, doesn't it, the old Jared Goff deal when they went up from 15-1 to 1 in 2016. So you're trying to make a living primarily, outside of the third round, on day three picks. And as a general rule, teams that do that don't enjoy a whole lot of success with those draft classes. They tend to not do very well with them, and it ends up being close to a lost draft. Now, of course, when you look at the bigger picture of things, you're trading a first-round pick for Brandon Cooks. You feel like you're bringing in a number one wide receiver that Sammy Watkins wasn't last year. Your second round pick going towards the Jared Goff deal. That second round pick in this draft helped you two years ago get your young franchise quarterback. Made your job appealing to somebody like Sean McVay, one of the best young minds in football. It's not a terrible price to pay in order to get that in both cases. Now, of course, it's risky when you specifically talk about the Cooks deal because you have to wonder, the Patriots got him trading away a first round pick to get him. A year later, they can't wait to get rid of him again, and they turn him into a first-round pick. What's the deal here? Maybe there's not much to read into it, but maybe there is. And when you look at the Rams, they're one of those teams that it could be really easy to get caught up in the hype train with them. They're the defending divisional champs. They had a home playoff game last year. They've got a young franchise quarterback, Jared Goff. MVP-level running back and Todd Gurley. The offensive line was significantly improved last year. Cooper Cup showed you plenty as a third-round pick out of Eastern Washington. The defense has Aaron Donald. Again, I emphasize the defense has Aaron Donald. And then you go out there and you sign in Dominican Sue in free agency. You trade for Marcus Peters. You trade for Aqib Tlaib. Yes, you let Tremaine Johnson go, but you brought in guys that you feel are better that have even more name recognition in Peters and Tlaib. You look at this, this is one of these situations where you see teams make these type of moves and the trading for Brandon Cooks when they feel like they're there or they're almost there. And I wonder if Les Snead and the Rams front office got lulled into a little bit too much of a belief in themselves more than what they actually are. That sounded like crap when I said it, but I'll clarify. They think they're at one place, and the reality is maybe they're just not quite there yet. And when you go so heavily into the trade market to bring in guys like that, it has the potential to absolutely blow up in everybody's face. I'm not saying it's going to. I'm not saying it's destined to, because sometimes these type of things can work out. But we've also seen other times where teams get too lackadaisical when it comes to focusing on continuity and chemistry and being about the trophy signings and the trophy moves and trying to sit there and wow everybody with the big names you get and plunking them in there and thinking it automatically works. And that's not always the case. Now, I have full confidence in Wade Phillips being able to figure out how to utilize Tlaib, because he did it at Denver, figuring out how to utilize Marcus Peters, uh, how to utilize and Dominic Sue on the same defensive line as Aaron Donald. But you're bringing in some potentially very volatile personalities on both sides of the ball. That could be really risky to bring in a young locker room with guys like Goff and Gurley. So I pause a little bit with them before getting fully caught up in the thing. Now, in terms of the picks that they actually have, one thing I thought was fascinating is, according to my uh, eyeballs, every single pick that the Rams ended up making in this draft was acquired one way or another via trade. That's just crazy. Like every single pick. They had a total of 11 picks between rounds three and seven, 10 of them between rounds four and seven on day three. And every single one of them came via maneuvering or trading or dealing. And I will say this, the Rams did a great job on day three to accumulate additional assets to get themselves more shots, to get themselves more chances. Because they weren't looking for a bunch of impact players here because they knew they probably weren't going to get them anyways. So now's the chance to take some flyers, take some chances on some young guys, and maybe a couple of them develop. Because you're not looking to this draft class to give you a ton of instant impact. This is about long term. And I felt like you could see that in this class. Now that said, I didn't feel like they did that bad considering the picks that they had. 
Note boom, the tackle from TCU, third round, feels right. He could be a future starter outside for them. Brian Allen, the center from Michigan State, not a bad pick. Could be a future starter inside. I look at round five and I see Micah Kaiser and Okoronkwo. You know, these were highly productive college players that maybe lack some of the athletic traits or measurables, but you feel like in round five, you're willing to gamble on these highly productive college players being able to figure out how to transition and still make it in the NFL. I think Micah Kaiser is a future inside linebacker in a 3-4. I feel like he's a future starter in a solid one. Okoronkwo, this is a guy that was kind of a tweener. He's not big enough to be a defensive end. Is he really even big enough necessarily to be an edge rusher in a 3-4? Would he have been better suited to be in a Sam back or in a 4-3? But this was a guy, again, a highly athletic in terms of the way he played, maybe not always the way he measured and tested at the combine, but he flashed his athleticism on film. He has the ability to bend. He's a try-hard type of guy. And he lacks in some areas, and he makes up for it in others. And again, we're talking about round five. Those guys are definitely worth the gamble. And I love to see guys like Kaiser and Okoronkwo being coached and under the tutelage of Wade Phillips because I have confidence he could potentially get something out of them. John Kelly in round six. You know, I thought maybe he was just a tad overpumped in terms of this draft class, but at the beginning of round six, you got a potential compliment there to Todd Gurley. Not bad. Jamil Demby has some upside as an interior lineman. I look later on in the draft, Justin Lawler in round seven. He was a productive edge rusher at SMU. I thought this was a solid class in terms of the guys that they did take, the job that they did to accumulate all those day three assets. And again, ultimately, if Brandon Cooks has a big year, then it would, may have been worth it to give up the first round pick. The second round pick was already worth it because it was part of the Jared Goff deal. Then you look at it and you say, okay, if you get a couple of guys out of this draft to pan out, it still ended up being a pretty good draft. I just don't know how much impact they're going to get out of it this year. And it feels like as much as they maybe believe that they were there and they're ready, they maybe aren't. And it would have been a better approach to have kept that first round pick, maybe utilize it in different ways. When you forsake the beginning of the draft like that, it could potentially have some long-term consequences.